We discussed John Dalton early in the year. We talked about his atomic theory, and we talked about how really it wasn't his theory. It was a compilation of the current thoughts of the day. Dalton did more than just compile the atomic theory. Dalton also did some studies of gases. He is credited with a law of partial pressures. Instead of showing you the law, I'm going to give you an example problem with the law and see if you can put it together. I have a container holding three gases. The pressure of the hydrogen in this container is half of an atmosphere, 0.5 atmospheres. The nitrogen gas in this container has a pressure of 0.75 atmospheres. And there's carbon dioxide in the same container that has a pressure of 0.25 atmospheres. And I want to know what the total pressure of the container is. Well, hopefully, you can see that if you just take the pressures and add them together, 0.25 plus 0.75, well, that gives me one atmosphere plus 0.5 more, that gives me 1.5 atmospheres. And that's it. That's Dalton's law of partial pressure. Now he did the experiments and showed this to be true, so he gets the credit for it. But I think it's pretty intuitive. Dalton says that if you have multiple gases in the container, all you have to do to get the total pressure is just to add up the pressures of the individual gases, what we refer to as partial pressures. Partial pressure of the hydrogen plus the partial pressure of the nitrogen plus the partial pressure of the carbon dioxide equal the total pressure of that container. Now this can be used in any case when you have more than one gas present at a time. One time that it comes in handy in chemistry class is when we talk about collecting gases. Gases are actually pretty tricky to collect from an experiment because when you collect them in the room you often get air mixed into it. So a clever way to collect gas is to use a system of water displacement. Over here, you see a reaction of zinc and hydrochloric acid. We've done this before. Zinc, when put in hydrochloric acid, creates a single replacement reaction. And that generates hydrogen gas. And so you can see some little bubbles in this aqueous solution. Those are meant to represent the hydrogen gases. And then you see these little diatomic molecules that are coming up out of the test tube and down into the tube. So these little white dots here are meant to be diatomic hydrogen. Over on the right here, you have a jar that's filled with water, and it's inverted in a dish of water. And what's happened is that this tube has been snaked underneath the jar, and so that the hydrogen is coming up and bubbling up through the water. And so once again, you see these bubbles over here, just like you saw in the test tube. These bubbles are these diatomic hydrogen molecules, and as the hydrogen fills up this jar, it's going to push out or displace the water, and you're going to end up getting a container filled with hydrogen. It's pretty clever, and it works well. The only issue is that you have water there. Water evaporates. You've known this if you've ever left a glass out for a while. If you have water inside the container, some of the water molecules are going to simply just evaporate from the liquid and also go into the container with the hydrogen gas. So you have these little water vapors, these little bent H2O molecules, also in your sample. So when you collect a gas through water displacement, you do get the gas that you want, but you also have water vapor. And so that's why in this graphic it says hydrogen plus water vapor. Now this is okay to have both gases in the container at the same time. Because if there's one substance that people have studied for a long time, it's water. We know a lot about water. We know that if you warm water up, it will evaporate faster. In other words, if you warm water up, you will increase the vapor pressure of the water because you'll have more water molecules that have evaporated and formed a gas. So in this graph, you're seeing temperature increasing on the x-axis and the pressure of evaporated water above the surface also increasing. As water warms up, the vapor pressure increases. And this has all been carefully collected. The textbook has this chart showing you what the pressure of evaporated water will be at various temperatures. So we can combine this with our knowledge of Dalton's law of partial pressure when we take on something like this. I know that I have 15 grams of sulfur dioxide gas and I've collected that through water displacement. I know the volume inside the collection container is 18 liters, and the temperature is 30 degrees Celsius. I want to know what the partial pressure of the sulfur dioxide is. Now I see that the gas is being collected by water displacement. So whenever we see those words, we have to be careful. 
This question is asking about sulfur dioxide, but if we're collecting by water displacement, we know that there's going to be water present as well. Fortunately here, all they're asking for is for the partial pressure of just the sulfur dioxide. I've got a mass, so I have an amount, I have a volume, and I have a temperature. So I can use my ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. R, we remember, is 0.08206 liters times atmospheres over moles times Kelvin. So first things first, I see that my sulfur dioxide is in grams. So I have 15 grams of SO2. I need to convert that into moles. One mole is equivalent to 64.1 grams. So that means that I have 0 0.234 moles of SO2. I see that my volume is 18 liters. That's good. But I see my temperature is 30 degrees Celsius. So I'm going to want to convert that to 303 Kelvin. Now everything's in the correct units. So I can plug into the ideal gas law. Myself a little bit of space here. PV equals NRT, and I'm going to isolate pressure. So I'm going to divide both sides by volume, so I get P equals NRT over volume. So my moles of sulfur are 0.234 moles. My ideal gas constant is 0.08206 liters times atmospheres, moles times Kelvin, my temperature is 303 Kelvin. I'm going to divide that whole thing by my volume, which is 18 liters. Check my work by canceling out units. Moles cancel out moles. Liters cancel out liters. Kelvin cancel out Kelvin. And I'm left with atmospheres, which makes sense because I'm solving for pressure. All is said and done, I get a pressure of 0 0.323 atmospheres. Now this question about the partial pressure of sulfur dioxide has really very little to do with Dalton's law of partial pressure. That comes in with the next question. We're the same setup. I'm collecting the sulfur dioxide through water displacement. But instead of wanting to know the partial pressure of the sulfur dioxide, I want to know the total pressure in the container. At the very beginning of this problem, we indicated that there would be two gases present. You would have your sulfur dioxide gas and your water present because we're collecting the gas through water displacement. So when we use the ideal gas law to solve, this pressure we found here is the pressure of just the sulfur dioxide gas because these moles right here were the sulfur dioxide gas. The constant is constant. The temperature would be the same throughout the container and the volume is the same for the entire container. So because we used the moles of sulfur dioxide, this pressure we found previously is just the partial pressure of sulfur dioxide. And that's what the first question asked for. To find the total pressure, well then now we can use Dalton's law of partial pressure. We can say that the total pressure is going to equal the pressure of the gases involved. Well, we have two gases involved. We have the partial pressure of the sulfur dioxide gas and because we're using water displacement, we have the pressure of water we have to consider. Fortunately, we have this chart from the book that tells us precisely what the partial pressure of water is at various temperatures. This problem is occurring at 30 degrees Celsius. So they're giving us the pressure of 31.8. Now we have to be careful of units. Our pressure on this chart is in millimeters of mercury. The pressure we found previously is in atmospheres. Now it doesn't matter what units you use, it doesn't require a specific unit in the problem, but we do have to be consistent. We either have to have both of our units in atmospheres or both of our units in millimeters of mercury. So let's just do millimeters of mercury. Let's take our pressure of the sulfur dioxide, which we found to be 0 0.323 atmospheres. Let's convert it to millimeters of mercury. There are 760 millimeters of mercury for every one atmosphere. That means our pressure of the sulfur dioxide is going to equal 246 millimeters of mercury. 
So now to find the total pressure, my total pressure is going to equal the pressure of the sulfur dioxide, which is 246 millimeters of mercury, plus the pressure of the water, which we see from the table is 31.8 millimeters of mercury. And I get a total pressure of 277 millimeters of mercury.